So welcome to today's panel discussion, uh, Smart Factory Implementation. I'm joined by a distinguished panel of uh, experts, should I say, from our industry, <laughs> or I hesitate to call them that. But anyway, from the extreme right, we have Richard Virgison from Yamaha. Uh, welcome, Richard. Uh, to his left, we have uh, Josef Ernst from ASM Assembly Systems. Uh, to his left, Adam Zubak from uh, Panasonic Factory Solutions. And to my immediate right, Jonas Ernst from uh, Fuji uh, Corporation. So uh, welcome, gentlemen, and uh, thank you for joining us today. The term smart factory describes uh, the PCBA and uh, supply chain within the factory. Pick and place machines uh, and vendors are at the heart of every line. This panel today will discuss the use of uh, these pick and place machines and uh, uh, how customers uh, approach implementing them in a smart factory environment. So if I can maybe start off, uh, first of all, maybe going from right to left, uh, Richard, uh, when a new customer approaches you requesting uh, strategy for implementing a smart factory solution, uh, what would be your advice to him? Where, where does he start? Um, where the customer starts is where we are uh, starting with implementing um, in their environment. What do they already have? What needs to be new or be implemented? So when they already having um, a Yamaha line, then you look to the environment, what is already uh, established or what uh, analysis we can make to implementing um, different st uh, strategies or improving their, um, uh, their production um, efficiency by looking to the complete uh, environment. So from material handling up to the setup verification system, uh, everything what's uh, involved before you start um, with the production uh, itself. Right, okay. Um, Yusuf, um, I mean obviously your equipment's going to work better with your equipment. That's the ideal solution, I guess. But I mean, uh, what's your approach to this? I mean obviously you're going to mixed environments as well. No, basically I can obviously also agree to my predecessor and it depends no doubt about also whether they have C-Place equipment or ISMS equipment in or not. But it's the final end, first of all, from my perspective, it starts with the goals, the targets, which the customer do have. So which challenges is he facing, which application we're talking about, do we talk about a flex application, or is it really high volume, different type of products? So what are the issues he wants to be solved? What is his key targets he wants to achieve in the first step, but also on the long run? So what, how, how his factory will look like from his vision point of view, maybe in two years, in five years, or even in 10 years. And uh, uh, based on this, then we are working together with, with the customers to work out solutions. Um, solutions, what he can invest based on our products, obviously, but also maybe even on customized solutions uh, in the first step to meet the first targets. Um, but in, in parallel, already considering that there might be two new technologies in the future available. So it means this open approach, connectivity, plays really a very important role from our perspective. So, and it's the final end, it's, it's a way which we have to go together with the customer. And uh, I strongly believe that this is not one solution, but obviously target is based on ASMRA solutions, uh, a customized then also solutions are necessary so that he can meet his targets. Okay, okay. Uh, well, that's, that's true. I mean, Adam, the, the approach between a sort of high volume user and a high mix user is very, very different. Uh, what would be your, your view on it? Uh, um, like Mr. Ernst said, I completely agree. It's a, kind of an open conversation with the customer. So when you're talking about a high mix or a high volume, I mean, that's just the discussion that you have with them. Say, what are your goals? Because uh, they may not even, they may say, we, we need some intelligence. We have these metrics that we need to improve. They might not know how exactly they can improve them. And so then we can show them, hey, we can collect this data from these machines. Mm -hmm. Uh, we can improve, we can show you these metrics, and we can show you how to improve these metrics, or going further, not even show the metrics, have the metrics update the system themselves. I mean, that's the true IoT to say, you don't need a person involved here, we collect this data, we update the system, now you're more efficient. Now that's very true, I mean, um, I guess you're not 
just looking at the metrics on the, on, on, on the, the line, uh, you're probably looking at uh, material to the line and this type of thing. Uh, so do you look at supply chain logistics and that type of thing as well, um, Jonas? Yes, indeed. Um, I think we all agree that Industry 4.0 is nothing which you can just grab out of the box and you have it. We are the founder of a smart electronic factory association together with other machine vendors, software companies, universities, and we started to make a maturity level module where customers first see where they are. What kind of product do I have? How intelligent can I do the whole production and the system? And when you see where you are, then you can start defining some goals. And when you have the goals, then you start step by step. It's not necessary to do everything industry 4.0. You have to identify where do I have the most benefits. And with this, we can start talking about the smart line. And that's true. It's not the full line that we're optimizing at this stage. I mean, at the moment, everything is uh, upwards of the, of the reflow oven, really. Uh, but but um, I suppose eventually we'll, we will work our way down the line. Um, so what typical gains do the panel see in... Uh, first pass yield uh, been implemented after having a closed loop uh, system between the SBI and the, and the printer. Uh, do, you, do you have any numbers you can put on it yet, Richard? Um, yeah, numbers is difficult. Uh, uh, customer case uh, uh, differences, um, different SBIs with different printers. It's all kind of uh, combinations possible. Um, but we see that um, more and more um, connection between SPI and uh, printers um, is requested. Um, and yeah, it's increasing the first yield, uh, definitely. And it's uh, improving customers' uh, yeah, yield on the total uh, uh, startup of the production line. Um. Yes, sir, I mean, I guess, I guess it really depends where the customer's coming from. In other words, what his first pass yield currently is. I mean, if he's, is he sitting at 85% or is he sitting at 95%? <laughs> so obviously, obviously, it depends where the customer is right now. Uh, and, and, and to put a concrete number behind, it's, it's quite challenging. So I really have to agree on this one. But I, we really see a significant change. So we talk about percentage rate and not just, let me say, something... 95.1 or 95.4%. So indeed, we talk about uh, a percentage rate, what we see out of our experience. Um, but you were referring to closed loops. So what we really believe is this closed loop approach we, we use already since a couple of years. I would almost say we use it since a couple of years. Um, but from, from our perspective and our, our experience is you really have to look into the next step and what we already did with, with uh, more innovative solutions or so continuously learning, continuous improvement of the process. And uh, this should start, first of all, really into also check into is your process reliable? Is it repeatable? So they do not just start changing something uh, and be still in the, in the deviation of the normal process. And then usually you are at maybe this, what I just said before, yeah, you can then one time measure 95.1 or 95.4, but it's not significant at all. So I'm, I'm convinced that we, we go now for the next step, or we went already for the next step, and it's not just pure uh, a closed loop control with threshold, and then say, okay, here, red light, red amber, whatever, and uh, you have to change something, but rather really check first of all that you have a reliable process, and then continuously improve your process by also continuously monitoring and more or less a self-learning system which you're implementing. And it will change the world. So we did now the, the first step is with uh, the inspection system and then combination with the printer, where obviously we agree that I would assume that the, the most or the biggest first proceed improvement you can achieve by having a very reliable print process, but obviously it will also follow with uh, the placement equipment and AUI and so on. Okay. Um, I mean, Adam, I guess, I mean, all of, all of you pretty much have your own systems that have um, printers, SBI, pick and place and closed loop uh, formation. So, I mean, that would certainly be, surely be the starting point. I mean, proving what first pass yield you can benchmark on your own systems and say, well, this is the optimum that we can, we can achieve here, um, but we can certainly work with whatever you've got um, and, and it'll be on, you know, um, possibly lower than, than, than this high benchmark number, but here's what we can achieve using our own systems. Would that be the approach? 
Uh, sure, you're talking about using third-party equipment. We go to a customer, they have an, an AOI already. We uh, <clears throat> implement a closed-loop feedback with uh, Koyang currently, and we, as the information is still pretty much the same. It's offset off, off, off of a part. You can provide the, uh, the offset data to the machine, and you're going to provide the same results. As you said, it's up to the quality of the SPI, uh, what, their, uh, what their levels of uh, tolerance are for the reading of, of the pass pace. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, do you have a view on this, um, Giannis? Yes. Yes. I think there's pretty much everything said. Of course, you can higher your quality. You have a quicker access, so you can also see when something goes wrong. So it's good to have this closed loop. Um, and of course, this is the first step of Industry 4.0. Here you can start. Here you can now work on self-learning machines, get the results from the past, apply it for the future to improve even more, and then without human being, just with the machine automatic correction that this machine or the whole line will get better by itself. Great. And I'd like to add on one comment. Uh, um, obviously, we all work with closed loop, loop systems, but I, for us, it was also important, let me say, and why the key reason why we also developed our own SPI system is that we really open share all the data. And I guess this will be not only for the SPI system, but also going forward, let me say, one key topic, really share all data independently, let me say, who is gathering the data, because then that's a, the truth or the basic that you really can go for a self-learning system. Uh, if you always have to somehow, do I get the right data, do I get all data, and obviously measuring means not always the same, same result especially, and you have to 100% trust your data, and that was at the final end one of the key reasons why we said, okay, we have to have our own SPI system. Yeah, I think it's important that you share all data in an open platform so that you can integrate with as many different configurations as, as possible. Um, let me move on to the other end of the inspection line, which is the AOI system. Um, I mean, what do you see, where do you see typical gains coming in that? Um, and I might load this question a little bit because um, one of my peeved questions with AOI was always that it's, it's a, uh, an image processing system uh, and it's difficult to send pictures uh, up the line, you need to send data up the line. Uh, and we're seeing evidence on the show floor here this week of uh, the first two AOI systems that I've seen uh, that actually use metrology uh, and, and data coming off instead of pictures. Um, do you have a view on this, Richard, on AOI uh, and, and what it can uh, potentially achieve to, to improve first pass yield? Yes, we um, definitely uh, um, using our AOI system to improve the first pass yield. Um, therefore, we have uh, a direct communication with our quality assistant uh, system who is feedbacking directly from AOI to the mounter so that the operator get immediately that information what is needed to um, solving the problem what is found on the AOI. So you do it before the reflow and therefore you have only one board uh, that needs to be um, uh, replaced or uh, changed uh, before you ending up with uh, several uh, PCBs in the oven, in the pick and place machines and um, after reflow getting at that moment the information. So we are working on a uh, complete um, uh, platform where you have a post reflow and post mounting AOIs in combination with each other with the, AO, uh, with the mounters. And in this way the operator gets immediately those information and even if an operator is putting in a new tray into the, fee, uh, into the machine, the machine will tell the AOI, hey, I got a new tray, so please inspect if the component is exactly the same as it should be. The orientation with OCR, they can check if the right component is on the right place. So all those changes during the production in the pick and place machines is feedback to the AOI and the AOI is reacting back on uh, the mounters, so having direct feedback to the, to the operator to increase that first yield. Okay. I guess, though, my question is, do you, do you have plans to make your AOI metrology-based as opposed to image-based? It's all metrology-based. It's all metrology-based yeah. yeah. at the moment. Yeah. Okay. 
okay. not using images uh, right. only for OCR okay. checking, but okay. but everything is metrology based. Um, Joseph, what, what are your plans on on the AOI side? We know what you've done so far on SPI. As I just indicated before, so we strongly believe that the SPI is basically the key and really the, the printing process as well as the placement process for the right quality. So from an AOI point of view, our steps are that we feedback the data and just what Richard mentioned. So really uh, um, collect the data, feed forward, feed, uh, feed backwards, uh, so that we can further support the operators, the te technicians really to find a defect in a very early phase and obviously also then based on certain rules even go for uh, um, even se kind of self-learning system, but this is really based on rules. So it's uh, um, if you have a defect that you really can op assign it immediately, let me say spot it, okay, where I have to change something or whichever parameter and also make clear recommendation to the process technician so that he can uh, improve the first pass yield further and even then avoid such kind of issues in the future. Right, okay. Yeah, Adam, you know, I think this is an important area and, and one of the things actually that Richard touched on earlier is that sometimes you get components coming in in the different sizes, so you need to be able to identify these things quickly. You know, it might, might be the same component but from a different supplier right. and it's just marginally different. Uh, so you need to be able to have a metrology system really to, to deal with that. Sure. Uh, it should be able to detect those parts and uh, I mean, that's what the AOI is there to do. Uh, and like we touched on before, now we can, with the feed backwards back to the machine, we can be detecting, hey, this machine is placing off in this in this direction uh, this much, so offset the placement gives you a little bit more leniency on your PM schedule, gives you a little more leniency on your uh, on your calibration. Uh, if your maintenance staff is understaffed, then you can push that to a, instead of like a three-week PM, do a full, uh, you can go from an extra week to a, a full month. Uh, so on top of all these other uh, uh, Integrations, I think uh, you get uh, extra functionality out of that. Yeah. Um, Jonas, unfortunately, you're getting the short straw because everybody's yeah. answered the question and you're the, you're the last one <laughs> no in the line. No problem. Maybe no we. Problem. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, we're having some drama in the in the in the, uh, the hall here, as you can hear. Um, what what is what is your approach to to the function of AOI and, and how it's going to contribute to the factory automation? I think the the first improvements are already set higher first pass yield, having more control. But in my opinion, it's the key for, for the future in regards of the self-controlled line. As I mentioned before, we have this association and we have a project where we collect all the information of all the machines. ETAC is involved, universities are involved. So now we, have, we are working with data scientists. They get the result of the AOI, good, bad, good, bad, and they always take all the information. Mm. Now we want to analyze this data, and every time it's bad, we see, okay, this was the, was the pattern of the line. Right. So the, the goal is that in future, before this happens, if the, if the algorithm sees, oh, there is something going in a direction, which I know that this will occur to a, to a problem, we will make alarm, make mm. some maintenance, for example. So even you don't know this hard, um, you don't need this know-how anymore because the algorithm knows if the degrees rise, a problem can occur. So you need this closed loop and especially the AOI as a last item in the line which can tell good or bad and how was it. So this will be the beginning and a quite important case in our eyes. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think we'll be democratic here and start and go on the other end of the line. <laughs> Richard, you've got your short straw. <laughs> yeah. So um, let's turn our attention to uh, the uh, supply chain, basically, um, and supply chain logistics. Uh, where do you see we can make improvements to minimize machine downtime uh, in the factory? Mm. What are the typical downtimes, uh, material ones out? This is something where you can automate that the machine already tells you, I need some material. Mm -hmm. We go further and even have a software which tells AGVs when to start driving because of the way and the time. This is a main fact and of course the maintenance. Uh, in, in our past we had just a, picker, uh, a counter, mm -hmm. two million pickups, you have to do maintenance. And in the future we are working on algorithm which detects that the OEE is going down and then says, okay, you can do maintenance with the head, with the feeder or the nozzle. And of course, at the final, learn again from these actions 
and to just better stuff to do in the next time. Okay. Um, well, it's certainly a good approach. Um, Adam, I mean, if you listen to IPC, they're, they're, they're quoting as much as 37% average downtime in a factory floor. Some people are saying it's much higher than that, over 50%. What sort of gains do you think once we get supply chain optimized in a smart factory are we going to potentially gain? Uh, well, I mean, the gain should be 100% uptime, right? <laughs> the, <laughs> the uh, I mean, inventory supply chain is a, it's a chain of events, right? And then there's, there's machine level. How do you keep the machine running all the time? Uh, so we do things like splicing, but then... There's, that's operator dependent, so they screw that up, and now we have a, a machine downtime event. So we go to auto splicers and offline auto splicers, uh, and now we have a method of keeping the machine running at the same, at all the time. But then how do you feed the machine itself? So then you have to have notifications based on inventory levels that go to the next layer, some storage warehouse. Uh, you need to send that notification to the actual warehouse and then even to a exterior warehouse. Uh, and then the next level from that, I mean, that's kind of assuming an infinite supply chain, but then you have to start thinking about uh, uh, lead times and scheduling and work orders, and so you have to talk about material allocation and say, for this work order, I'm assigning these parts so that they're assigned to this work order so you know that that work order is going to be completed and do your scheduling based off of that. Uh, and with those, those qualities in, a, in an MES, then you can really make sure that you're never out of parts uh, to keep your line running. I mean, Yosef, I I suppose it's a little bit um, like the question we had answered earlier on, on, on uh, first pass yield. Depends what you're making. If you're making the same boards all the time, if you're an automotive or, or making cell phones, then you're making the same thing all the time, so it's the same parts you're delivering. Uh, if you're in a high mix factory, for example, with all lots of lots of different job lots, it's going to be a much more complicated issue. What's your view on it? Uh, basically, I just can't share what my prudent is, as I said, though, and I also agree with the percentage rate, which you basically indicated. So, okay, we can talk about 45%, 55%, 60%, but if you're really in a high-flex environment, uh, the utilization of the equipment is rather low. Uh, if right. you talk about OAE, you so just mentioned around about 50%, there's, of course, significant room for improvement. And I guess the, the, the big lever is really having the material, the component, the right point of time at the right place, and obviously the right component. Right. And uh, handling millions of components and uh, millions of different type of components is a challenge for our customers. And uh, there we have to help them really with software solutions, with traceability solutions. So and not just from the, from the let me say, uh, the, the tower, look, uh, the store system at the line, but already at the main store towards the machine. And from my perspective, it will even start earlier, let me say, at customer from the suppliers from our customers, that really the whole supply chain can be managed. And there I see a huge, huge potential. Uh, obviously, first proceed is very important, no doubt about for quality, but from uh, an overall productivity improvement, I see especially in the environment which we just described, a huge op op uh, potential uh, uh, for our customers, and there we have to help them and provide them the right solution. And obviously, as long as there is not only a C plus in there, we even have to agree on that we have open solutions uh, that we talk to each other. No, I, I couldn't agree more, I mean, and I think, um, you know, Richard, this could have the potential between a customer who's currently running five lines could probably do the same amount of work on three. Uh, so it has huge potential benefits to, to, to customers going, going forward. Uh, what's, what's your view on, on this? Um, yeah, we see um, the last time many customers uh, with existing equipment from 10, 15 years ago. And... Um, with nowadays the, the uh, equipment that we have, um, sometimes it's possible to replace two uh, lines with one line and having an uptime which is much higher than those two altogether. Um, we've seen it with several customers now and um, it's not only uh, the efficiency of the machine that is increasing and having a higher quality, but it's the whole environment around. Eh? The what you say, uh, you need to have the right material on the right time, on the right place, and the operators need to have a strict following order how to handle all these uh, types. And in this way, you can see that here in Europe, the high mix low volume is becoming high mix high volume. We can achieve very high volumes 
and a high mix uh, uh, environment. And that's where I see, I don't see it in the rest of the world, that they can follow this high volume, high mix applications. Uh, that's interesting. So there's something unique for Europe. Okay. Yeah. Well, on that note, uh, gentlemen, I think we're going to we're, we're running out of time because we are on a time basis here, unfortunately. <laughs> so we're going to have to cut things a little bit short today. But but um, you know, we've had some really interesting feedback from all of you on on uh, this topic, and undoubtedly, this topic is going to continue to evolve and be discussed. Uh, and no doubt, we'll have a more in-depth chat when we come to, to the Prodotronica later in the year. Uh, but for now, I want to thank you all for taking part. Richard Burgesson from Yamaha, uh, Josef Ernst from ASM Assembly Systems, Adam Subak from Panasonic, and of course, Jonas Ernst from uh, Fuji. No, no relation to, to, to Josef, of course. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, that's it for today, and thank you very much for joining us. <laughs>